Welcome everyone and this is lecture 29 of this series on fluids and electrolytes. The lectures explain and expand on the concepts explained in my book Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, a Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find more, more information on the book and how to find it on Amazon in the description below. We are now starting a new chapter, chapter 4, and this is a small chapter on potassium binders. Let's start with a quick introduction on potassium binders. Sodium polystyrene sulfonate, SPS, also known as k -exalate, was approved by the FDA in 1958, and it was the only binder until 2015. We have two new binders. Pterimer, Veltasa, and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate or Lokelma. These two binders are better tolerated and can be used chronically to treat non emergent chronic hyperkalemia. Now, the advantage of chronic use of binders, we can use medications like angiotensin receptor blockers, like ACE inhibitors, that uh, otherwise would have been discontinued. Um, sometimes we have a compelling indication and we get hyperkalemia so we use the binder we mitigate the hyperkalemia and then we can use the medication so what are the indications most binders have delayed onset of action so they're not appropriate for hyperkalemic emergencies okay please go back to my lecture on hyperkalemic emergencies to see how that's treated i'll provide the link below so binders are indicated for management of non-emergent and chronic hyperkalemia. So for that purpose, we don't just use the binders. We counsel on low potassium diet. We can adjust medications. We eliminate sources like uh, salt substitutes that contain potassium chloride, any potassium supplements, etc. And like I said uh, just a second now, inhibitors of the uh, renin and jetensin can be used now. Uh, even though they may cause hyperkalemia, we can use a binder, reduce the potassium, and we can continue to use these essential medications. Now, this is the chemical structure of sodium polystyrene sulfonate. It's to the right. I have to say that in some countries, there is a calcium polystyrene sulfonate. So instead of sodium, there is a calcium, and this is the chemical structure to the left. Okay, so what about SPS? It's a cation exchange resin approved in 1958. The usual dose is 15 to 30 grams. The more usual dose is 15 to 30 grams. And it's given one to four times per day. And it's the only binder approved as a rectal enema. The dose is 30 to 50 grams every six hours. Please do not use that. I don't think there's any reason to use uh, SPS. Um, and there are even less reasons to use it as a rectal enema. Um, I wouldn't ever use it as a rectal enema. Um, SPS should be given at least three hours before or three hours after uh, oral medications because it would bind medications, not just potassium. And it has a big dose of sodium. So 15 grams of k or SPS contains about 60 milliequivalents or 1,500 milligrams of sodium. Uh, and the name tells you that is sodium polystyrene sulfonate, so you know that it contains sodium. That could be problematic in, in a patient with the edema or congestive heart failure. So uh, there has been cases of intestinal necrosis, occasionally fatal, with SPS, especially when, when combined with sorbitol. So it should not be used with sorbitol anymore. Also, postoperatively, if the patient hasn't had any bowel movements, it should not be used. Patients with an ileus should not be on k -exalate. Patients with fecal impaction, patients with a known history of severe constipation. And this really doesn't just apply to SPS, to any binder. Now, inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic colitis, bowel resection also are not appropriate indications for the use of SPS. If you have hyperkalemia, do something else. SPS is not specific for potassium. It can bind calcium, it can bind magnesium, and other medications, like I just said. 
Now, the SBS exchange ratio is one milliequivalent of potassium per one gram of resin. So if we are giving a 30 gram dose, then we would bind 30 milliequivalents or 30 millimoles of potassium. And only one third of the resin is absorbed. After the potassium exchange, so sodium will go in, potassium will, will go out, uh, then the SPS is excreted in the stool. None of it is absorbed systematically. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any long-term studies with SPS. We have two studies, a uh, number of patients, about 30 for about 14 months. So we don't really have good studies with SPS. So this is why it should not be used chronically. Onset of action also is very unreliable. It could take hours to days before it starts working. Therefore, again, it's inappropriate for emergency treatment of hyperkalemia. It can bind to other medications, warfarin, metoprolol, furosemide, amoxicillin, amlodipine, and phenytoin. You can see these medications are very commonly used. So, Fortunately, now we have two other binders that are much better and more appropriate for chronic use. Uh, personally, I use either the pterimer or the uh, sodium uh, zirconium cyclosilicate. I currently do not use uh, KXLate or SPS. SPS should only be used if you have no other alternatives, and I don't think it should be used chronically at all. So uh, pterimer or pterimer Sorbitex calcium, you can see the complex structure on the screen. And uh, this uh, medication um, is approved or was approved in 2015. So pterimer, also known as Veltasa, was approved in 2015. It's a polymer, so it's not an exchange resin. It exchanges calcium for potassium. It does not contain any sodium. The active ingredient is uh, pterimer sorbitex calcium. Most common side effects are gastrointestinal. So you can have constipation in 7.2%, diarrhea in 4.8%. It's important to know that it, it binds magnesium. So you have to watch for hypomagnesemia. So it's a magnesium and a potassium binder. Hypomagnesemia was reported in about 5% of patients and about the same number of patients, same percentage, had hypokalemia. The same warning I just said, people with ileus bowel obstruction, post-op patients with no bowel movement should not be on a potassium binder. You have to find another way to lower potassium. Now, the studies that were done with pterimer were good, okay? So this, is, this wasn't the case with KXLA. So here we have good studies, and uh, patients, most of the patients had chronic kidney disease. So this is the our target population. It is available for uh, use as an oral suspension. So it's a powder. Uh, you refrigerate it at 2 to 8 degrees, and then you mix it with 90. You mix the dose. Um, uh, it's 8.4 grams. Uh, in 90 ml of water, you stir it uh, completely. You mix it, and then it's uh, taken immediately uh, with food uh, once daily. And it works in seven hours, so this is uh, reliable, and it is sodium-free, so this would be appropriate for someone with, uh, say, congestive heart failure or chronic edema. Like I said, the dose, the initial dose, is 8.4 grams daily, can be increased up to a maximum of 25.2 grams daily. In my experience, uh, this medication is effective. Many patients actually uh, don't even need it once they once they're stabilized they can use it two or three times a week um, I have one patient who is on 16.8 grams uh, the rest are either on 8.4 gram daily or even less often than daily now you should not add pterimer uh, to heated liquids okay and it should not be heated itself um, and uh, like we said with SPS, with the KXLate, it should be given three hours before or three hours after oral medications to avoid potential binding of these medications. However, there are three medications that you, he that you have to keep in mind where this may be significant. Metformin, levo levothyroxine, and ciprofloxacin. Okay, so with these medications, you really have to be careful. Now, several clinical trials showed efficacy and safety of pterimer. 
So in uh, the, the first study, uh, we, uh, it was a phase two study, we had 306 patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD, uh, GFR 15 to, uh, to 59. So here we have patients with uh, stage three and stage four chronic kidney disease. And over one year, the patients were able to maintain their potassium in the normal range and patients were on RAS inhibitors, an ACE or an ARP. And at the start of the trial, they had potassium over five. About a third had New York Heart Association congestive heart failure class one or two. So these are the kind of patients where uh, we are going to use uh, this medication. Diabetics with chronic kidney disease, maybe with congestive heart failure, who have a compelling indication to the use of an ACE or an ARB, like diabetic nephropathy or chronic cystic CHF. And, but they are hyperkalemic, so this way we can use uh, a, one, uh, a binder such as Petromer and we can maintain an optimal dose of the RAS inhibitor. This way we don't have to reduce it and deprive uh, the patient of the benefit, of the full benefit of these medications. Uh, another trial, the Opal H. K trial included patients with uh, CKD, also on RAS inhibitors, and with Petromer, we were able to maintain potassium in the normal range. About half of the patients on placebo had to discontinue RAS inhibitors in this 12-week study, like you would expect. And there are other clinical trials with the Petromer that are ongoing. I'm going to stop here, and in the, in the next lecture, we are going to discuss the other uh, binder, the sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. See you then.